Spider-Man. Oh, the hero you are. I am sure everybody here loves Spider-Man. I love him too, probably more so than I do the Incredible Hulk. Sorry, big fella. Spider-Man has been through a lot since his debut, from getting bit by that radioactive spider, losing his uncle and then his father figure, by that I mean Tony Stark, saving the city, falling in love, losing Gwen Stacy, losing Aunt May, losing Mary Jane to his radioactive spider cum. No, seriously, that actually happened. Oh yeah, and he was murdered in an alternate universe. But you know what? No matter how many hits he takes, no matter how many shit movies get made about him, Spider-Man always finds a way to come back. Spider-Man was everywhere back in the day, from toys, of which I owned a few, to TV shows, and most importantly, video games. Some were good, some were bad. I think I owned a small few of Spider-Man games growing up, like Spider-Man Friend or Foe and Battle for New York on the DS, but god, I wish I grew up with more of them. One of those Spider-Man games was actually one of my first introductions to Spider-Man. Not fully, however, because I watched Spectacular Spider-Man and that 90s cartoon, but that game I'm going to talk about today is Ultimate Spider-Man. Not to be confused with the Ultimate Spider-Man TV show, released in 2012. Based on the Spider-Man comic series of the same name, Ultimate Spider-Man is an open-world action-adventure game published by Activision and developed by Treyarch, the same company behind the Sam Raimi Spider-Man games. Spider-Man 2 in particular is worth mentioning because it inspired Treyarch's other Spider-Games, as well as other games of its genre like Hulk Ultimate Destruction, Infamous, and Prototype. As a matter of fact, Ultimate Spider-Man came out on September 26, 2005, one month after Ultimate Destruction. Shurik has also worked on games such as Minority Report, Everybody Runs, and even Spider-Man Web of Shadows. But unfortunately, much like Activision's other partners, they were absorbed into the Call of Duty salt mine, starting with COD 2 Big Red 1, and since then have been involved with other COD games, minus a select few, like the Modern Warfare Trilogy, World War II, Advanced Warfare, and Ghosts. F*** you, Activision. Anyway, starting out in 2000, Ultimate Spider-Man was a comic book line that sought to reinvent Spider-Man to a modern audience, as well as retool a few elements like the origins of Venom. This caught the eye of Activision, and they approached Treyarch to make a game based on the comics. Treyarch, having experience with the Sam Raimi Spider-Man games, accepted the offer, and so work began in June 2003. They collaborated with Ultimate Spider-Man artist Mark Bagley to bring his art to life, and brought in writer Brian Michael Bendis to pen the story. So it's basically a similar approach to Hulk Ultimate Destruction, only difference is I believe Ultimate Destruction had a much better told and cohesive story than Ultimate Spider-Man. Fight me! This was going to be the most ambitious Spider-Man game yet, and it paid off to generally positive reviews from critics and gamers alike, and would gain a cult following years later. This game even has mod support to this day. Now, Ultimate Spider-Man is somewhat special to me, as it's one of my first introductions to Spider-Man as a kid. Back then, I was scared of this game because of the tutorial, but eventually I got access to more Spider-Man thanks to the 90s animated series and the best comic book cartoon ever, Fight Me, Spectacular Spider-Man, and Ultimate Spider-Man, the 2012 TV show. I replayed this game a few times throughout the years, second on GameCube before a crash, and on a GameCube emulator back in middle school. All of which I have never fully beaten, but now I can say I am ready to take responsibility for reviewing this game. Today, in celebration of Spider-Man No Way Home coming out, I am going to review Ultimate Spider-Man the video game and see if it holds up well to the test of time. Now for this video, I am going to review the PC version which was ported over by Beanox, and I'll be using a PS4 controller add-on. I know there are mods that probably make the game better, but I'll be playing this game the way it was originally intended. I am pretty sure this game is better on console, but for the sake of convenience, this is the version I will be looking at. So the question is, does Ultimate Spider-Man hold up well to the test of time? Is it truly one of the best Spider-Man games? If you like what I'm doing, then feel free to subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of when I upload new content. I am this close to monetizing this channel and making a Steven Universe review, so subscribing to this channel helps me out a lot and gives me a lot more motivation to make videos for you guys. Now suit up, true believers, because this is Ultimate Spider-Man. So the game opens up with a recap we are all familiar with. This is Peter Parker. He got bit by a radioactive spider, and since then he has become the one and only Spider-Man. Well, until Spider-Verse happened, but still. Three months ago, Peter Parker reunites with his childhood friend, Eddie Brock. We see the two meet up in the lab where they find their, quote-unquote, inheritance, the Venom symbiote, also known as the Black Suit. 
The symbiote in this game has a really different origin than how it usually is in the comics. Instead of originating from the planet Clintar who attached to Peter, or if you want to go even further from the blood of an evil alien space god, the Venom symbiote is an experiment conducted by the fathers of Peter Parker and A. Brock as a means to cure cancer. Unfortunately, due to executive meddling, the project was discontinued and the symbiote was locked away. Until now. Spidey sneaks into the vault and steals the symbiote for himself, becoming more powerful, but the symbiote goes haywire and unbinds from Parker. When Eddie finds out about this, he heads back into the lab and dons the suit for himself, transforming him into Venom. The two then engage on a football field, which acts as a tutorial for the game's combat. After a bit of fighting, the gang runs off and takes the fight to the streets, where Venom gets electrocuted and cornered by the cops. Cut to three months later and we see Peter Parker hanging out with his girlfriend Mary Jane, who's fixing his spider costume so he decides to head home and grab his shooters. But not before doing a bit of exercise, which acts as a tutorial for the web swinging. So he grabs his web shooters and heads back to MJ to get his suit. He fights the shocker and does a bit more hijinks in his suit before we learn more of what happened on the night. Adrian Toomes, better known in the comics as the Vulture, tells his boss that he has sights of the suit and we get our first level as Venom and this is where I start to see the game at its flaws. What follows is a mostly disconnected story as the game jumps between Spider-Man and Venom. Like, I like the idea of playing as the hero and the villain from a story perspective because it provides a lot of context on how everything went down from the villain's perspective, but the game just jumps between Spidey and Venom without any flow or cohesion. It all just jumps together for the sake of gameplay. The main villain of this game is Bolivar Trask. In the comics, Bolivar Trask is an enemy to the X-Men and is responsible for the creation of the Sentinel robots. Another problem I have with the story is just that there are several plot holes that are just never explained as the game jumps between Spidey and Venom. So in this game, Bolivar Trask is after the suit in order to use it to cure cancer again, I guess? He said that they're testing the suit and studying it for a reason, but like, I don't even know what it is. And speaking of studying, how did the symbiote gain sentience even though it was made by man? How did the suit affect Peter Parker and Eddie Brock even though they both don't have cancer? I know it cured Eddie of his cancer in the comics, but how does the suit work on a non-cancer patient? Does it just straight up cause him to go mad? Actually, this part of Venom was retconned in Venom issue number 11, where the Venom symbiote straight up lied to Eddie Brock about having cancer just so he could be with him forever. Huh. <laughs> Talk about an abusive relationship. Why didn't Venom get Spider-Man's web swinging powers when he took off the suit? He doesn't even get his iconic spider symbol until the very end. Who sent Beetle? Apparently he was sent by Latveria, Dr. Doom's home country, according to Peter Parker, but why? Why did Latveria send him to free Green Goblin from S.H.I.E.L.D.? Why was the Green Goblin even captured by S.H.I.E.L.D. in the first place? This game has only 55 minutes worth of cutscenes and it was written by Brian Michael f***ing Bendis, and he somehow didn't have the time to explain any of this? That's probably a me problem for sure. I know and I'm sure that these queries are explained in the Ultimate Spider-Man comics, but if I was a kid or a fan who never heard or read the Ultimate Spider-Man comic books, I'd be pretty confused. When I played Hulk Ultimate Destruction, I wasn't confused by some of the elements in that story because they were given to us through background context thanks to the Blonsky files. Yeah, remember when I said those things had no purpose? Well, they actually do story-wise, and they are compelling for leading you up to the game's twist. Ultimate Spider-Man does not have that, and I feel like the story requires you to read the Ultimate Spider-Man comics to fully know what the hell is going on. Once again, I'm pretty sure these questions are explained in the comics, but again, that's a me problem, but even then, I do believe Brian Michael Bendis should have done better. But as I've learned with The Last of Us Part 2, a game can literally have the worst story ever written and somehow still be reliant on everything else. So, let's keep going. Speaking on the graphics side of things, Ultimate Spider-Man looks hella good. Much like Sly Cooper or Taz Wanted, Ultimate Spider-Man takes on a cel-shaded look straight out of the comics, taking inspiration from Mark Bagley's artwork. And while the NPC models look mediocre, everything else is stunning and holds up insanely well. From the colors, the models, the words that pop up both in-game and in cutscenes, this game just straight up looks like a comic book come to life. I'd even say this game looks better than Sly Cooper in terms of comic book cel-shaded games. I also like the different comic cover loading screens in between story missions. They're well illustrated and I think do a good job of giving you what to expect. My favorites include the one where Venom is stalking a child, the one with Venom and the soldiers, the one with Venom, Spidey, and Electro, and the cover for the final boss. 
This was also the first game that made me love the color purple with Venom, which is weird because Venom, even though he's canonically black, is a wider range of colors in a multitude of Spider-Man media. And I know for a fact that the colors are there to highlight the light off his body. First he was blue in Todd McFarlane's artwork, then he's red and blue in the 90s cartoon show like some sort of freezer burn and sunburn, then he's blue in Spider-Man Unlimited, he's purple, then sometimes black in the Ultimate Spider-Man comic books, and now he's always black in the modern media. God damn, is it just me or is Venom a walking Burger King kids club? Anyway, I dig the purple highlights on Venom. It gives him this sort of toxic look to him and it just pops and makes him look like he would blend into the darkness. The highlight of the game's visuals has to be the cutscenes. While some of them are compressed, they take on this comic panel style that just adds to the immersion and comic book art style, and I love it. Aside from Spidey's friends and foes like Rhino the Shocker, Beetle, Adrian Toomes, aka the Vulture, Carnage, Craven via Billboard, and- Liz Allen? Who the f- is Liz Allen? I had to look her up, and she's a supporting character in the comics who hangs out in Peter Parker's high school with ties to the Green Goblin and an obscure villain named Molten Man, who is also the fiery guy in Spider-Man Far From Home, and in Spider-Man Homecoming, she's the daughter of the Vulture. Anyway, aside from Spidey's friends and foes, the Marvel Universe runs through this game pretty much front to back. Aside from Bolivar Trask, who is an X-Men villain, you get people like the Human Torch of Fantastic Four, a reference to Iron Man, Thor and Captain America, although they only appear on cover art, Doctor Doom, but he only appears in concept art for some reason, the Wolverine of all people, and even Black Nick Fury. And this was three years before Samuel Jackson took up the mantle in the MCU. So it's real cool to see that Spidey isn't the only superhero hanging out in New York City, and it provides a good sense of world building, though S.H.I.E.L.D. for the most part does really serve a purpose in the plot other than capturing Green Goblin and standing in Spider-Man's way. Hey, remember when Marvel didn't have all these licensing problems? I remember. Anyway, the animation like Spider-Man's web swinging are all fluid and well animated. Some of the cutscenes feel a little awkward, but they're all well choreographed and well shot and well edited. Though if there is one problem I can criticize about the cutscenes, especially on the PC version, is that the audio is mostly out of sync. This is most apparent in the non-compressed cutscenes. Parker? Richard Parker? He's dead. But his son is not. The suit was built with Richard Parker's DNA, and his son is Spider-Man. Wow. And getting close to him is giving Brock more control over the suit. Get Brock to tell you everything. Up. Why can't you keep this electric guy you're supposed to be keeping in prison in prison? And that lady, the silver lady that captured Eddie the other day. Why couldn't she? Peter. You need to call- I need to quit getting almost killed by stupid people is what I need. We have not yet confirmed reports that this is the same creature that Iron Man Psst! Hey, you remember the big rhinoceros looking guy? You're gonna have to be more specific. He's like, on the loose. Oh man, the trig finals next period. Ten minutes there, kick the rhino guy in the ding ding, and ten minutes to get back. You can do that with your mask on backwards. The writing overall is okay. Spider-Man is still the snarky, equipped, bounding, friendly neighborhood superhero we all know and love, and the dialogue, as far as I can tell, uses a couple of quotes from the comics, like the Inheritance line. Also, fun fact, this was one of the first games I remember as a kid that taught me the phrase, Oh. My. God. Oh. My. God. I. Know. The biggest problem with the writing for me personally is the story. Like I said, this game leaves so much to be answered unless you read the comics and leaves pivotal plot points from the comics out of it. But I'm not much of a comics expert, so feel free to explain some stuff to me down below. The music, however, is pretty kickin'. It was composed by Kevin Manthey? Manthey? Hope I pronounced that right. Who has an insane track record on movies like Scream 2 and 3, Batman Gotham Knight, Justice League The New Frontier, as well as cartoons like Generator Rex, Ultimate Spider-Man, again, and even Invader Zim, of which he was nominated for an Annie. Oh yeah, and plenty of video games like Shrek 2 and Shark Tale. The soundtrack is composed of heroic, electric, orchestral tunes, and some of them are pretty catchy and memorable, but the rest are just okay. One thing I also like about it is that it gives the missions a sense of urgency. Some of my favorite tracks include the title theme, which gets you in the mood to kick some spider ass. The training theme is pretty catchy.
The open world is mostly barren of music, but when it gets going, it's pretty good. The Electro Boss theme is pretty fire, especially towards the end. However, my favorite track in the whole game has to go to the theme that plays where you fight certain bosses as Venom. Overall, the music is catchy and the voice acting is solid. This game features Sean Marquette as Spider-Man and you know, I'd say he does a solid job. He makes Peter Parker sound like a believable teenager and gives a strong feel to his delivery. He's no Yuri Lowenthal or Josh Keaton when it comes to voicing Spider-Man, but you know, he works. He's good. Definitely better than Drake Bell's Ultimate Spider-Man, I will say that. Hey, Slappy. Ready for another round? I am here to win back the honor of my family name. What? I was watching Fist of Legend last night. <laughs> Is this for real? Told you. Superheroconspiracies.com it, it, it says I'm a deformed mutant. You're not. And, and some doof calling himself Speedball is the coolest thing since the Ultimates. And this is going to haunt you. Yes. Yes, it is. Ah, must have taken a nastier beating than I thought. My brain feels like it wants to climb out of my skull. Okay. Wow. That was odd. Maybe I just need to take a couple days off. Relax. Just not be Spider-Man for a few days. Maybe actually do something that doesn't involve, I don't know, people trying to kill me. But for me, the standout performance in this game has to go to Danielle Capillaro as Eddie Brock. He gives Eddie this nervous sounding, sort of paranoid sounding voice like he's been through hell in that suit and it's just, it's just fantastic. His name is Peter Parker. He lives with his aunt in Queens. He's still in high school. And he'll come to you of his own free will. No, I don't think we have to worry about that. Mr. Trask. I have been looking forward to this. Eddie? I can't believe. You know what I can't believe? I can't believe that after all the things you did, all the things you made me do, that after all of that, all you got was three years in a golf course prison. You can't do anything to me in here. The guards, they aren't near. Well, Everyone else is good too, and one of the voices I recognize in this game is Electro, who is literally voiced by Johnny F***ing Test, and I can't unsee it in my head. Alright, no more screwing around. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do it right. <laughs> That's more like it! This game does not have any difficulty settings, but it can sometimes be a breeze through, at times. But aside from the easy missions, I think this game provides an overall decent challenge for any Spider fan, though my frustrations seem to be attributed to the controls. So overall, I'd say Ultimate Spider-Man slaps in the presentation department. The graphics look nice, the textures are vibrant, the music is solid, the character variety is aplenty, and the voice acting is good in spite of its weak writing. But hey, we're not done yet, true believers. Ultimate Spider-Man plays as an open-world action game in the same vein as Treyarch's Spider-Man 2. 
I've never played Spider-Man 2 the game, but what I can tell you is that each of Treyarch's Spider-Man games evolve with different gimmicks that make them stand out from each other. Like, Spider-Man 2 was the first of its kind with a variety of missions including pizza delivery, Spider-Man Web of Shadows had branching story paths, a different ending and combat variety, and Ultimate Spider-Man has two playable characters, Spider-Man and Venom. I did not mention Spider-Man PS4 because while that game is similar, it was not made by Treyarch. I should go over Spidey because he's probably familiar to those that have played Spider-Man 2, but before I get into that, we should address the controls. Generally speaking, the controls are all fine. The web swinging feels light and fluid, and the webs stick to the building, so that's something. The combat is fine, at least for Spider-Man, and missions, for as simple as they are, are okay and pretty challenging. My main problem with this game's control is the camera. The best way I could describe the camera in this game is it's unwieldy. For one thing, whenever you move the camera, instead of standing still like any other camera I've seen, it just jumps back into position behind Spider-Man. This is especially apparent when you're web swinging and jumping around this Venom, and it made a lot of the chasing sections a bitch because this feels like I'm fighting against the camera just to get a good view of the enemy, and the arrows they give you while you're chasing are of barely any help. This is all especially apparent in Venom's chase against Electro, which, oh boy, I will get to. I even tried adjusting the camera in the settings, but it only works for the mouse. Anyway, another thing in these Treyarch Spider-Man games is the traversal around New York City, which I found to be pretty fun. It's very fluid and it feels tight when you web swing. Spider-Man can shoot his webs at buildings and can web zip, which I found to be very fast and useful. He can also crawl on buildings, which starts his run, but then devolves into a slow-ass crawl. Venom also crawls, but from what I can tell, he's at least faster than Spider-Man. Thankfully, you can also web zip up buildings, but even then, this is a bitch when it comes to the racing missions. This game also has combat, which includes a lock-on feature where you can focus on enemies. You can punch, kick, and combo the punches and kicks, as well as use your webs to tie them up and stun them, or even swing them around. One of the problems I have with the game is that there's not really enough variety, both in combat and in missions. The combat is fine with Spider-Man, but I think it's most fun especially with Venom. You can't upgrade your attack, and you can't even do web attacks. You can only swing them around, up, or down. And aside from the dropkick move you can do, the punches and kicks are all you can do as Spider-Man. The game gives you a heads up that Spider-Man can perform some consecutive moves, but I don't even know what they are because they don't teach them. Which kind of sucks because I see the basis for a really fun upgrade and combat system like Spider-Man 2 the game. I'm pretty sure Treyarch was under the gun when developing this game, but I do think that combat could have been so much more. Spider-Man also has a spider sense, which is useful for indicating you to dodge. You also need to web down your enemies, otherwise they will get back up. Also throughout the game are these button mashing sequences where you need to rapidly press buttons to reach a certain gauge level. Next we should go over Venom because he's arguably the most interesting aspect about this game and the best playable character all around. Because Venom never got Spidey's powers in this game, even though the symbiote was literally on Spider-Man the first few minutes, he can't web swing, nor does he possess any of the wall crawler's well-renowned abilities. So instead, Venom can throw cars, attack you with his tentacles, eat people, grab people and break their backs, and instead of web swinging, he jumps into the sky and can zip with his tentacles. Oh yeah, and he can also climb buildings and increase speed by leaping. Your eat ability is also important as with the press of a button, you can eat people to heal yourself. Your health deteriorates in this game, so you better keep an eye out for snacks. Yo. Come here! Ah! <laughs> Only problem I have with Venom is that he doesn't have any attack variety besides tentacles and punches. You can mix the attacks together and that's about it, and it's hard to aim your throwing of the cars because of the janky ass camera. But overall, I had the most fun with Venom. His tentacle attacks have good impact and overall it's just plain fun to run around and kill people with the exaggerated swagger of a man-eating alien monster. Walking up to a child all like, FEED ME THAT ASS. I have absorbed his nutrients. No one will refuse my generosity again. The general gist of any of Treyarch's Spider-Man games is the open world. You can swing around New York City to find secrets such as comic covers, landmark tokens, and you can do missions and some activities that pop up in the open world. These missions all range from city events, which will have carjackings, fighting criminals, and saving citizens, while the open world missions consist of time trials, combat tours, where you fight groups of enemies, and even races with the Human Torch. You can also play Venom in the open world once you beat the game. Much like Ultimate Destruction, there's an alert bar with which the higher you raise it, the more enemies will come after you. And he even comes with his own jumping challenges. Some of which involve special platforms and also story missions which often switch between Spider-Man and Venom, and these missions are kinda hit and miss. 
you also need to complete missions out in the world in order to access these story missions. It all comes back to that variety thing I mentioned, like I think Hulk Ultimate Destruction had more mission variety even though its structure was repetitive. The story missions will often have you chase people and as Spider-Man you need to save people in between chases. The chase scenes are somewhat obnoxious to keep up with all due to the janky camera and the controls like web swinging and hopping don't do so well on tight corners. Venom has better missions than Spider-Man because you at least have missions where you fight waves of enemies. As for the other missions, there's honestly nothing much else to say about them other than the races can change depending on location. I just wish there was more variety in the open world, and given Treyarch's experience with Spider-Man 2, I definitely believe they could have done more. In fact, that's the best I could describe Ultimate Spider-Man as a whole. There's definitely a lot in this game I think they could have improved and expanded on more had they been given enough time. Maybe work more on the combat besides punching and kicking, and add more mission variety to the story and the world. There's definitely a recipe for a great Spider-Man game in here somewhere, but I heavily believe they could have done so much more. There's also enemies you fight throughout the game, which don't have a lot of variety because all they do is shoot guns, but Venom missions have the most variety with these cars and the helicopters. For the bosses, there are a total of 14 bosses in the game, most of which consist of villains from Spidey's Rose Gallery and rematches of Spidey and Venom. Most of these bosses are pretty simple, but some of the best boss fights go to Venom. Your first boss is Venom himself, who also acts as a tutorial for the combat. You fight Venom a total of four times throughout the game. In these fights, Venom will punch you, lash at you with its tentacles, and he will eat you, of which you need to break free of. After is a pretty pathetic fight against the Shocker. There's nothing for me to say about this fight, honestly. Next is Wolverine. You fight Wolverine as Venom in a bar, and he will jump around and slash at you, and he will heal himself. Once his health gets low, you will get into a button mashing sequence where you need to fight him in the next room. Following him is Rhino. Rhino will start this mission with a chase sequence where you have to rescue people and then take out a couple of bad guys. After which, you need to damage Rhino's weak spot to gain his attention and lure him into a cement pool and use a wrecking ball. After which, Rhino will fight you at a car dealership where he throws cars, slams the ground, punches and charges at you. You have to wait for his sparks to go out to damage him, but be careful because if you hang out for too long, he will hurt you. Then after Rhino is a rematch with Venom. It's basically like any of the other Venom fights you encounter, except the gimmick is that Spider-Man will have a headache that stuns him and leaves him open to attacks, so you need to plan out. After that is Electro, aka many a young Spider fan's worst nightmare. Oh god, not Electro. The first thing you do against Electro is you chase him as Venom, and on a few occasions he will mock you and unleash a burst of electricity. For the longest time, I hated the mission against Electro. I thought it was damn near impossible. He dragged out the scene for about three minutes, but god, it feels like forever, and this chase is hindered even further thanks to the janky camera and the slow climbing, and unfortunately, the arrow is of barely any help. Not to mention that if you die in the fight itself, you need to start the chase sequence all over again. And I died my fair share, but point is, I was on the verge of giving up. I was gonna cancel this review and be all, fuck you, Venom, fuck you, Spider-Man, fuck you, Electro, fuck you, camera, fuck Fuck you, controller! Fuck you, mission! Fuck you, game! Fuck this guy! Exactly. Eventually, I persevered and beat Electro, and after doing so, I found the fight to be overall good. Truth be told, even though I was furious, Electro might be one of the best fights in the game because he's one of the bosses with the gimmick. Electro will throw thunderbolts at you and still do that shockwave thing. <laughs> but he will also damage Spider-Man, and you need to keep an eye out on your health. However, when Electro's health gets low, he will absorb the electricity of nearby billboards, becoming more powerful, and he'll electrocute you non-stop. The only way to hurt Electro is by throwing cars at him and removing his blue electricity and opening him to hits. But he will also absorb more signs when his health gets low, and he will keep hurting Spider-Man. So this fight has you keeping on your toes and it has you thinking outside the box, as in destroying the signs to weaken Electro, and I think this fight works. It's really challenging, and I think that's what makes it work. Too bad the aiming still sucks when you throw cars. After Electro is your first fight with Beetle. Beetle actually has one of the best chase sequences in the game, as he will summon hologram shields that block your path, requiring you to move your way around them. His fight takes place at the top of an abandoned building, and Beetle is another one of my favorite fights, both as Spider-Man and Venom. He's more air-based, which makes those homing attacks more helpful, as he throws grenades, shoots a laser at you, and does a force thing? Eh, whatever. Then we have Silver Sable. Silver Sable is more athletic as she jumps around and kicks you and shoots a gun at you. After which, you need to take out Silver Sable's men, and this is actually one of my favorite missions overall, where you need to fight enemies and run away from Sable's minions. This mission also has helicopters that shoot at you. And then there's Green Goblin. Green Goblin will hop around the arena and throw fireballs at you, but he's also surrounded by fire and you need to wait for him to cool off. Once he does so, that's your chance to strike. The fight continues in another room, except Green Goblin hops around the room and he will set the room on fire. 
he will also summon a ring of fire that dries him out. Afterwards is another fight against the beetle. This time he requires a sample from Venom. I require a sample. You chase Beetle for a few minutes, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that every fight starts with a chase sequence, until you reach Warehouse, where he still flies around and throws his bombs at you. However, when his health gets low, he'll use his blue shields to trap you in the middle and make these death laser pits that you need to stay off. He will also use a three-way laser, do the force move, and has laser blades. The more you hurt, the more pits spawn. After him is another fight with Silver Sable, but this time as Spider-Man. She's basically the same, except when you be here, she helps you take care of some citizens. After she gets kidnapped by Venom, Sam Sam Raimi style and you have to chase him and fight him. Yada yada yada, do this and that, except he throws cars, and you have to protect Silver Sable. Finally, we have Carnage. Definitely one of my favorites, if not for the novelty of fighting Carnage's Venom. Carnage will hop around the arena and on occasion he will do a tentacle spin. However, his gimmick is that when his health gets low, he runs away like a little bitch and heals himself, prompting the only button pressing sequence as Venom where you have to open doors. Took me a while to open these doors, but overall it's a solid fight. The best Venom fights, I just say, go to Electro and Beetle. As for best Spider-Man fight? Eh, probably gonna go with Beetle, again. So overall, I had a decent time with Ultimate Spider-Man. Its controls, while a little janky, control very well. The web swinging is great, and Venom is fun, in spite of its shaky camera and lack of mission and combat variety. Alright, let's wrap this up. I'm getting pretty tired. So at one point in the game, Adrian and Bolivar Trask end up capturing Eddie Brock, interrogating him to gain control of the suit. As the game goes on, they find out more info about the suit and how Eddie felt about it, including the revelation that the suit was made with the DNA of Peter's father, and that when he's near Parker, Brock gains more control over the suit. During this time, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been getting more clingy around Spider-Man's duty work, requesting that he let S.H.I.E.L.D. do the dirty work themselves. Then a bunch of stuff happens between Spidey and Venom, the next day, Peter gets tranquilized and captured by Silver Sable. He escapes and fights her for a few minutes and saves a few people, but then Venom shows up and kidnaps Silver Sable. He manages to defeat Venom and falls to his tranquilizers. Later on, Eddie wakes up back at Trask Industries and he hears a loud scream. And then Carnage shows up. You, Parker. Knowing that it's Peter Parker, no seriously, Eddie turns into Venom and battles the Red Symbiote. Later on, we actually see how Peter became Carnage. He was interrogated about the suit, revealing that the suit bonded with him and the small particles in his body want to join with the Venom suit. Toombs then injects some kind of serum into Peter, presumably the Venom sample gifted by Beetle, for some reason, and then he turns into Carnage. Once Venom defeats Carnage, he absorbs him and at long last, Eddie has gained absolute total control, and now he has a score to settle with Trask. Trask, cowering with a gun, is cornered by Spider-Man, who then hands him a file detailing everything he knows about his parents. But then he's cornered by Venom and Silver Sable, whose contract expired 10 minutes ago and then she walks off, never to be seen again. So now Spider-Man has a score to settle with an old friend. <laughs> The final boss is a heroic helipad hoedown against Venom. This battle takes place on the roof and it's basically better than every other Venom fight that came before it. Venom does all his tentacle attacks instead of one, throws these metal crates, and he will on occasion attack Trask's helicopter. All while a big fire goes on in the background that requires you to reach the helipad. By all merits, it's not a great final boss, but it's definitely better than the Venom fights that came before it. Another thing I like about this fight is that the tutorial theme plays during this fight, so that's a really cool touch. Once you defeat Venom, Spider-Man will finish him off, and just like that, it was over. Once Venom is defeated, he escapes off-screen and Peter finally learns what happened at Trask Industries 10 years ago. Peter and Eddie's fathers were tasked to burn the symbiote and start over due to Trask's abuse, but Eddie's father held on to the symbiote and took it on a plane, causing it to crash. Only three passengers survived, one of which was Peter's mother, who died in the ambulance. Peter hands this info to Fury, suggesting that Eddie Brock see it himself. Meanwhile, at a prison island, Eddie meets up with Bolivar Trask and then kills him. I assume because the screen just cuts to Peter and MJ at a sunset. Peter tells MJ that he's worried about Eddie, which also cuts to Venom jumping off a building and into the night. MJ comforts Peter and so, Spider-Man lives happily ever after. The End
As far as I can tell, there's no 100% reward for completing everything in Ultimate Spider-Man. Once you beat the game, you unlock the opportunity to play as Venom in the open world, of which he comes with his own missions. And as you play the game, you unlock concept art, character models, comic book covers, and landmark tokens. It's also worth noting that there is a limited edition version of the game, of which, while not unlockable, this version features bonus content such as character bios and behind the scenes. However, you can unlock suits, such as the black suit, a wrestling suit which is literally just this regular suit without the textures and emblem, a yellow and green suit called Arachnoman, which in the Marvel Universe is a part of an in-universe movie parodying Spider-Man, and regular Peter Parker, with and without hoodie. Kinda like last year rewards for a Spider-Man game to be honest. Hell, Venom doesn't even get unlockable skins, despite the decades worth of source material they're working with. But you can get some with mods, so take that for what you will. Overall, I had some fun revisiting Ultimate Spider-Man. It has some solid gameplay, great graphics, and fun gameplay with Venom, but it also suffers from a weak script, janky camera, and lack of mission and combo variety. As much as I love Ultimate Spider-Man, this game has so much that I think should have been done a lot more, and to be honest, I felt kinda disappointed coming back to it. Not saying it's bad, but it definitely could have been so much more. After this game came out, the Ultimate Spider-Man comics continued to last until 2011, when it was relaunched as Ultimate Comics Spider-Man, featuring the debut of Miles Morales. And there hasn't been a playable Venom in an open-world Spider-Man game ever since. Which honestly sucks, because Venom was a hell of a lot of fun. Though I hear rumors that after Insomniac Spider-Man 2, Venom is getting his own video game, and that sounds awesome, but right now, we'll see where that takes us. A lot of you might say this is your favorite Spider-Man game, and that is awesome, but for me personally, the best Spider-Man game probably is, and forever will be, Spider-Man PS4. That game basically took all the Treyarch Spider-Man games and refined them with tighter and more fun controls, more combat and mission variety, level variety, a playable MJ and Miles Morales, and you can interact with citizens and take selfies with Spider-Man. Did any of these games let you take a selfie with Spider-Man? Exactly. Joking aside, I sincerely believe Ultimate Spider-Man is a good game, but given Treyarch's history with the webhead before and after this, I think they could have done a lot more. But not as great as Hulk Ultimate Destruction, don't at me. Which is why I'm going to rate Ultimate Spider-Man a 7 out of 10. Could have rated a 6, but I'm just too nice to this game. Coulda, woulda, shoulda.